Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Graham here again with Dr. Andrew Wilson for the Wilson Weekly. And there is plenty to talk about, isn't there, Doc? Hello. Yes, good day, Graham. And uh, I, I'm not sure if we should be apologising or not, but we are going to have a bit of a go again at the Reserve Bank uh, today. So uh, I, don't I hope think we they're at- apologise for that. Well, you know, you, you feel a little sorry for them, don't you? Or do you? <laughs> it's like. Uh, uh, but today, you know, obviously we had our well, we had our rate rise uh, this month. We have been predicting it. You know, you heard it first here, sort of. Um, and uh, we've also been a little bit crit- critical of the Reserve Bank in terms of its uh, position on monetary policy. Uh, we have consistently said that we felt that they paused too soon, um, that it would only mean that they would have to re-enter the raising the rate raising environment and maybe have to go even harder, uh, which um, we'll discuss. But when we have discussed, you know, we feel there are more rates uh, in the offing. But uh, certainly the latest minutes from the Reserve Bank, which did cover that meeting, um, you know, the last meeting, November meeting, Melbourne Cup Day meeting, um, uh, were full of, you know, why where things are different now and, you know, uh, and there's quite a few of uh, sort of recanting on previous positions from the Reserve Bank. So I've actually listed them all. So we're going to go through it all, what they said, and there's some other interesting things as well. But um, so well, yeah, and Doc, also- if you've taken the time, if you've taken the time to list the shortcomings yeah. in the RBA's commentary, this is <laughs> going to be a cracker. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a couple of slides in it, but. Uh, the uh, uh, and but we've got some important economic data, which is uh, the good news, really. Which is it's one of those good news, bad news types of things because the good news is sort of bad news for interest rates because the good the news keeps on getting better in terms of the economy. But whether that means more upward pressure on inflation, you know, that's the problem here. And uh, we Reserve Bank have been telling us, oh, you know, we've been waiting and seeing because there's this delayed effect with higher rates and it'll come through. Hasn't come through. Not a sign. Hasn't been a sign anywhere. And they're trying to dig up a few signs here and there. Oh, is that a sign? Oh, no. Is that a sign? Maybe that's a sign, right? But it hasn't been a sign because inflation's still way too high. Um, but as I said, we've got the latest uh, labour market data, which again is very, very strong, Graham. No sign of a cooling in our labour market, really, with the key data. And we've also had uh, our wage uh, our wage data come out, which is the September quarter wage data, wage index from the ABS, a little bit backward looking, but we only get that every three months. So it is a, a very significant data set because it tells us how wages are going. And again, we said it here, um, you know, that we would get very close to 4%. We believed that the March result, well, sorry, the June the quarter wage result was a little mysterious because it actually showed annual wages growth declining compared to the previous uh, March quarter's results. I thought it's going to catch up, surely, given how strong this labour market is. So um, we should get rolling and uh, have a look at the data because we've whetted all those appetites out there, I'm sure. Um, so uh, here we go. Time for an RBA crunchy sandwich. <laughs> yes, something like that. So here we go. Here's the uh, all the latest data from my housing market, of course, and we're going to focus today on on some very key economic data and look at what the Reserve Bank has said in the minutes from its uh, Melbourne Cup Day meeting. Of course, next week, Graham, are you excited? We're going to have the latest house price data and unit price data for November. Hot off the press, first to see it here. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And again, we'll see some rises, just giving a, a quick preview to that, um, that prices are still rising. And probably rising at a reasonable rate, given that we're expecting some easing um, in uh, in prices growth, but still seeing prices growth coming through. But we'll we'll have a look at that next week, Graham. So I can tell you're excited. Uh, and um, can't wait. Yeah. So we'll only, it will only be one month, only be one month off from the whole year. So I'm actually pretty excited to see how we're well, tracking. It'll, it'll sort of tell us the whole story, more or less. So. Uh, we can yeah. then start thinking about next year, and that'll be what we'll do also. 
going forward in our next couple of shows talking about what we expect from next year's housing market. So let's have a look at those RBA November meeting minutes. Of course, the RBA released their minutes two weeks after the result. So we've got that out uh, just uh, recently. And uh, I don't know, is this exaggeration or not, but RBA minutes reveal a raft of failures. So that's the first thing. So what am I talking about here? A raft of failures, Graham. Is that a little bit too poetic a ra- or uh, is a it? A raft of It's quite, of uh, it's quite, it's quite punchy quite, language there, Doc. It's, yeah, pun- it's punchy. Okay, well, I've got to back it up. Right, I've uh, I've done the I've talked the talk. Now I've got to walk the walk. Right, so okay. here we go. Okay, so let's have a look. And I've I've put this headline: Is this a question of RBA competence? Question of RBA competence. So let's go through all the backtracking that happened in the minutes in the <laughs> latest minutes. So these this oh, is this all quoting the RBA. So the first one: underlying inflation was stronger than expected. These are the reasons why they've increased rates. Underlying inflation was stronger than expected. So that's the first than expected. The next one, demand pressure in the economy being stronger than had been expected. The next one, inflation was expected to decline at a more gradual pace than previously expected. The outlook uh, for output, the outlook for output growth has been revised up in the near term compared to the previous forecast. So they've Revised what the how they how strong the economy will be uh, compared to their previous expectations. So this is partly reflected stronger than expected. There's that word again, population growth. I don't know where they're getting that from because we knew what the immigration numbers would be, and I'm not <laughs> sure we should. And they would be saying, oh well, because it's uh, you know um, uh, more students have come in and more tourists have come in than we expected. So mm, okay, we can. Look at the data there just to see the trend, uh, whether it was certainly we expected, we expected strong growth from students and given the close, the shutdown of our borders uh, and also from tourists. So, okay, it was stronger than they expected. All right. Uh, and more strength in private and public investment than had previously been expected. You know, wouldn't you want a couple of bucks for that word expected? Uh, appearing in the minutes, well, you know, there's a few there. So, um, and what they're saying like the is, RBA, sounds like the RBA's expectations are not very realistic. No, and, and doesn't that come into the question of competence, Graham? You know, yeah, is it a well, question of competence? I don't know if we should be. But, I don't know if we should be relying these things on, wrong. Yeah, I don't know if we want to go on expectations rather than data. I'd, I'd like to expect that. Uh, that Beck well, wants to go on a date night tonight, but let's not rely upon it. <laughs> oh, well, lucky you, mate. You know, high five. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but what they're saying is that they think the economy will be stronger than they thought because of population growth and that governments, um, particularly private and public anyway, investment is also stronger than, than they expected it to be. So there's a few, you know, uh, U-turns there, wouldn't you suggest, Graham, in the core uh, essential elements that you would expect the Central Bank of Australia to have uh, a good record of, but no, nah. uh, particularly given that they shocked a lot by going into pause mode in May, right, when many said, what are you doing here? I mean, it's good news. We didn't want interest rate increases for sure, but we don't want that to have gone too early, be premature with putting it on pause, which clearly we have been, meaning we have to go back and start banging the economy again with a number of interest rates because we, you know, took our eye off the ball in a, in a sense, um, you know, by our lack or by, you know, all these expectations, which are clearly have been wrong. Um, uh, let's keep oh, going. wait, there's more. There's oh, more. Wait, there's more. There you go. Yes. Wait, yes. there's more. <laughs> Steak knives at the end. So recent retail sales data suggested that spending had held up better than had been expected. Again, had been expected. So. You know, they've been telling us that, you know, consumption and retail sales and the ABS has been paddling along with this type of narrative that, oh, retail sales were down. But as we mention every month, Graham, and you heard it here, retail sales had eased, but they're coming from this enormous, well, they haven't really eased, they continue to grow, but the trend growth rate had eased. But they're coming from this amazing growth that we had 
last year because of the COVID stimulus packages. This isn't rocket science, mate. We would have known that the fact that they maintained their levels, and we said that retail sales were 30% higher, plus plus 30% higher than they were prior to COVID, right? So they've just um, yeah, have grown in, in that period. And, and we've maintained that level. So regardless of population growth or inflation, we're still obviously spending like drunken sailors out there, and that's why inflation is still high. You know, who's doing their analysis, for goodness sake? Um, and as I said, the, res- the <laughs> ABS are, are continuing to peddle this, oh, retail sales are showing a decline in consumption, and this is the lowest. They, they were spouting that this was the lowest trend growth rate in retail sales in history, it's come from a huge, you know, peak. You know, of course it's falling away. It couldn't have maintained that unless we were still throwing money at people, like with the COVID mm. stimulus. So it's just, I mean, really, this, this is, it's logic and it just really questions the competence if you're making decisions about, you know, are we still spending or not, when we clearly still are and at very high levels. So we'll move on. The forecast rise in the unemployment rate being more gradual than previously been expected, right? So that's the unemployment rate. There's that Uh, word again. There it is. Uh, This is a beauty, mate. The outlook for wages growth has been revised a little lower. So, Graham, expect next month to see more of that word expected because this is before that wages data was released. And they're saying the outlook for wages growth has been revised a little lower in the near term based on the signal from timely indicators. They've got to start working on these timely indicators, whatever they are, because as we'll see shortly, (laughs) we have recorded the strongest growth over a year in wages in our history, right? So the outlook for wages growth has been revised a little lower. Ooh, I think we're going to have a... Ooh, wages grew a little bit more than expected in next month's minutes. So, you know, um, and of course, it will finish, we'll keep going. It would take longer to bring aggregate demand and supply. So that's national demand and supply into balance, you know, so we're getting inflation under control because we're balancing demand and supply than previously expected. <laughs> so there's another one. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's just have a look at some more. Uh, bits and pieces oh, from the there's minute. More. There's more, mate. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at some positives. You know, I, I think I'm sick of the word more than, you know, less than, more than expected, right? We've said enough of that. And that was just littered throughout the minutes of the Reserve Bank's commentary. So banks have not seen a significant rise in the incidence of households experiencing difficulty making their mortgage payments. So where's the cliff? Doesn't exist, never existed. Uh, and they're just validating that now because banks have not experienced a significant rise in people may, having difficulties making their mortgage payments. Um, uh, and their latest, this is interesting, their latest inflation forecasts uh, uh, for higher inflation uh, ha- had not been predicated on one or two rate rises. So what they're saying is um, that their forecasts would be for higher inflation, but they're currently their latest forecast. Let's hope they can get those right. Um, have been actually predicted on the basis of one or two rate rises. So they're saying there's more to come. There's more to come because that's what they're basing their forecasts on, right? So, um, and this is the other thing we have said this over and over again, Graham. The cash rate remained below policy rates in many other countries despite similar economic conditions. We've been saying that. You know, the US uh, official interest rate was around about 4% when we were 5.5%. And yet uh, they had similar economic conditions to us, and yet their interest rate was way below ours, right? So there's something telling you what's wrong here. And yet their inflation rate was well below our inflation rate. So they had, the US had higher interest rates, but lower inflation. We've got lower interest rates, but higher inflation. So don't you, don't you, something suggest there that it's out of whack, you know, comparing it to mm. particularly the US. And guess what? We've had to increase our interest rates to catch up with the US to get to hopefully the position that they have on inflation. 
Now, this is the really interesting part, and I'm going to finish on this, Graham, because I think I've, I've <laughs> belted them around ahead of it today. But um, So are the RBA now overtly shifting responsibility of their forecasts to staff? Now, what I noticed when I read the minutes, Graham, was all these mentions, which I hadn't really seen before, of the word staff. Staff said this, staff predicted this, staff did this. So they actually mentioned that word staff in relation to the information they were getting from staff uh, seven times in that minute, in their minutes, right? Uh, and I looked, I thought, I just don't usually, we don't usually see that. They don't mention that this is like the so staff. Hang, so hang on. You know, so the Reserve Bank, the the board of the RBA that are making the decisions are actually relying upon employees underneath them to set these incorrect expectations <laughs> that we continuously have to revise. Have, is, well, have I nailed it? Is that what's happening here? Well, that's what they're saying now, Graham. <laughs> so, the, so, 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 the in, so the interns at the Reserve Bank that's are right, providing yes. staff Yes. Providing this information, yes, they're probably just out of university, so they well, don't understand cycles or haven't experienced them. Well, they might yeah. be textbook trained. Yeah, yeah, staff. This is a good yeah. one, Doc. It's a good one, Graham, because of course we've had, as we've shown in this, all these we didn't expect this, and we didn't expect that, and we didn't, ex- and all this stuff. That's why we're putting up interest rates, right? All these uh, revelations of failure. Right, which it is. We didn't expect this. We didn't expect that. Right, but now we're saying it's not our fault because we've mentioned through this thing that staff said this, and, and we've never really seen IFM. So was, I looked back at the previous month's minutes, right, and the, the word staff was only mentioned once, once, right, in that whole in all the minutes, and it was in a different context, right. And I think oh, this good. is all about well, don't blame us, blame the staff. Right, overtly so, shifting yeah. responsibility. Yeah. So now we're going to say to them, so hey, we're completely and utterly freaking wrong, and we're just going to openly say that that's due to this information coming from wow. our staff. Yeah, so you it know. doesn't change how freaking wrong you are. <laughs> yeah, that's well, aren't you supposed to take the information and make decisions based on that? Look, or, or, or have at least some competence. So look. I'm sure there are ways that the rhetoric can work their way around the implications of, of, mm, of yeah. blame shifting here, but it was, I thought, quite pointed that we saw all these mentions of the word staff, which we really, and I'll look back over previous minutes, I'll, I'll do that just to see that I'm not just picking on one particular minute, uh, one month's minutes, uh, you know, but as I said, I just looked at October's, you know, uh, October's minutes and they only mentioned it once and it was in a different context. And these minutes, of course, were trying to justify why they've raised rates after keeping rates on hold, what is it, five times out of six months, right, despite the economy booming clearly, despite absolutely no evidence that interest rates had done anything, despite interest rates being well below anywhere else in the world, particularly the US, which has got a lower inflation rate, it's like, okay, uh, you know, this is the mea culpa in a sense. But uh, we're going to say, well, does, you know, that uh, who, who do we who's to blame for this? And it's maybe the staff. So I think we've had a bit of a belting. We've given them a bit of a belting today, Graham. I'm not sure what you think about that, but I think it's pretty well justified on the evidence going forward. So uh, let's have a look uh, at the. I labor think market. it's. A, I think just to be clear, Doc, the belting's justified. This is getting beyond a joke now. So well, we, you know, but the point I is, Graham. We're not coming to this position late because we have been saying this for months, right? For months we have been saying this and nobody likes to talk up interest rates. We know that causes pain. It's designed to cause pain. But don't you want to take your medicine now and just not get a lot sicker later on, you know? Isn't that the whole point? Um, and, and you know, this is the concern that we're going to have to really jump on, you know, uh, what's happening with, uh, with uh, inflation. Uh, by putting up interest rates perhaps higher that we missed the opportunity back in May to continue to push up interest rates to keep up with the rest of the world in a sense and hopefully push uh, and have had some impact, you know, but now we're having to play catch up, right? Um, so let's mm. keep our fingers crossed that it, it works out all right. 
So we had the latest labour market data, which just adds to all this business of the economy still booming. The, the jobless rate uh, just ticked up a little bit to 3.7%, but it's been floating around 3.6, 3.7 for months. Um, we had a, another big rise in jobs, and the Reserve Bank saying, oh, well, that's because of population. Yeah, okay, but still, you know, you would expect to see some shedding of labour if that was going to mean uh, downward pressure on demand. But jobs up by 55,000 over the month. Uh, unemployed actually rose, and that's why we saw a higher unemployment rate, up uh, sharply by 28,000. But the number of unemployed has been falling for months, Graham. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a, a sort of an adjustment for that. Uh, participation rate up to a record 67%. So we've now got the highest proportion of uh, those in the workforce from the potential workforce. So those that are, are all ready, willing, and able to work, we've now got the highest proportion of those actually working, you know. So what a remarkable position. And New South Wales has the lowest jobless rate at 3.4%. There's the trend. Look at that. That's quite remarkable to see that, uh, you know, flat unemployment rate uh, for such a significant period of time. Well, it's a year. We've just had it floating around a record low rate. That's got to tell you something about how strong the economy is. And I really do think that it's a little disingenuous to be blaming population growth on all this. We knew that was going to come through. Um, and, and really, isn't there some sort of a lag between a migrant coming into the country and getting a job in the first place? You know, and we all know out there that it's a very, very strong labour market. New South Wales, best result there for the unemployment rate over October, 3.4%. Uh, and we can see there's just a little bit of upward movement over the year with the states but still very, very low, and that's the point I've made. There's been no sign of movement. And they said that, that the unemployment rate looks to not have declined, not have increased at the rate that they expected, you know. And clearly, that's the case. Uh, and here we go, the wage index, uh, which even though it's some good news, is not good news for rates, really, uh, and maybe will give the Reserve Bank some justification if they raise rates over December. So up by 1.3% over the September quarter. That's a massive increase over three months, Graham. If you multiply that by four, you get 5.2% over a year, which is huge, you know. But the annual increase uh, went up from 3.6%, which we mentioned we thought was a bit of a, a dodgy number in a, in a way. It's quite low given how strong the labour market is to a record. This is a record annual growth in Australia's wages, according to that index, of 4%. Now, we said it would get close to 4%, and we were right because of how strong that labour market. But, of course, surging wages means people have more money to spend, which means that it will increase demand and that will put upward pressure on inflation because employers have to cover those wage increases, right, uh, and that means uh, pushing up uh, prices to cover those wage increases, record wage increase, um, which means that will create even more stimulus for employees to ask for more money. And that's that wages uh, prices spiral that we're all sort of concerned mm -hmm. might uh, start happening. So, And that means accelerating wages are a factor in rising inflation. And, um, you know, once again, uh, it's just adding to the uh, sense that, you know, we, we're still I've got uh, some way to go, Graham, in terms of uh, inflation and those key Drivers, and I can't believe they actually said that that wages growth was going to be, you know, uh, under control in their latest minutes. And now we've got this record jump uh, over the year in, uh, and really over the quarter as well in the wage index. And uh, I think a, a bit of that is some issues with that. We've said it over and over again. Some issues with that ABS seasonal adjustment model, Graham. So let's finish yeah. off with the auction market late. Uh, Spring auction market certainly now starting to show the impact of listing surge, Graham. We've, we've predicted this again. This is what happens at the end of the year through November into December. We do have high numbers of listings. It does put downward pressure on clearance rates. Um, a lot of buying activity has been satisfied. We've had a very strong market this year. Uh, a lot of buyers support their properties um, and are now enjoying them. And, of course, it's, um, uh, you know, those that, uh, have, 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 uh, who buy then sell realize that they've got to wait till next year now because they can't put their properties up for sale. So, uh, that creates that end of year higher listings, um, end of year seasonal effect where we see, uh, marginally lower 
clearance rates uh, regardless of the cycle. So let's have a look at those weekend results, Graham. Big numbers here, another huge weekend for Sydney, 875 Ooh. auctions. Down a little bit, not too bad, 67.2%. But again, it's that sagging effect of big listing numbers. Sydney's had near year high numbers of auctions for the best part of a month, Graham. Um, and that, of course, eventually means that there's more competition amongst sellers and there's more choices for buyers out there. And that's what, uh, and that's what creates that downward pressure also on clearance rates. Look at Melbourne, Graham, 1160 auctions. Um, Ooh. Big number, 200 more auctions than the weekend before. Uh, still, down a little still bit. held not, strong. Not too bad, you know, just holding there. Uh, we know Melbourne's been a little bit of an underperformer on expectations this year. Uh, Brisbane, a similar result to the weekend before with numbers of uh, auctions and clearance rates. Adelaide, another big weekend of auctions in Adelaide. Now, you know, Adelaide's dropped below that 80% uh, benchmark that usually we expect from Adelaide every weekend you know, down to 77 points, which is still a pretty good result if you're a seller, but 124 auctions is a big number. And, and Canberra, just about the same in Canberra, but Canberra's been the clear auction market underperformer uh, really for the last six months. Uh, so we can see yeah. there just that easing in clearance rates in Sydney, um, certainly well below or, or 10% below where it was during the boom in uh, in autumn. Uh, and into June, but nonetheless still a, a seller's market, a, a positive market for most sellers, just under 70% so far over November. But we would expect that to just to continue to a similar story in Melbourne, but uh, not quite as strong as Sydney. Um, uh, and Brisbane just steady really uh, with November so far compared to October. Uh, and uh, Adelaide as, as well, just a little bit lower, but still a very strong result and the strongest result of all the capitals is what we typically see. Uh, and Canberra, uh, just a little lower. And as I said, that Canberra market hasn't had the results that um, uh, the other capitals have had this year. So uh, we've only yeah. got a couple of weekends left, Graham, uh, in the auction market. Uh, there'll be a lot of sellers anxious to uh, clear their properties. But you know, Graham, it's a good time to be a buyer really out there. It's good opportunities because uh, those sellers that want to finish the year with a sale, uh, we'll perhaps be a little bit more open to negotiation, you know, so a good time for sellers. But we always say that uh, early spring is a good time for uh, sellers, late spring a better time for buyers because there's more stock around. Uh, and I think I just said that in the reverse before. But uh, as I said, good time if you're out there looking for a property, certainly because you have more choices and perhaps sellers are uh, looking to clear their stock will be more negotiable over the next couple of weekends. Those auction results are available. We're a little laid out because of some of our problems in the, getting the data through last weekend, but typically we get those Capital City results out um, uh, at around about 6.30 on a Saturday night, and then we have the full national report uh, with the regional breakdowns in Melbourne and Sydney on Sunday mornings. Uh, and just finishing off, as usual, Graham, look out for that uh, uh, Infinity My Housing Market uh, property app which you can get a, a link to. You need a password to get access to it, though, and you can only get that through Infinity. So it's got to go through Infinity, but this is a great little app for you if you're looking to know what's happening in real time in our housing markets because it gives you the asking prices and rents for every suburb in Australia, um, and you can filter it for uh, property type, townhouse, unit, and house, a number of bedrooms, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, and... Uh, it will give you the uh, high price, the low price, the median price, and the number of listings, uh, and that's also for rentals. So look out for that one. There's a screenshot of what you can get that's using uh, on the app, the Blacktown, as an example there, and you can see there that Blacktown was uh, was selected for price, um, house, five-bedroom, and you can see there the median price of uh, $1,230,000 and 12 pro properties for sale. So get hold of that one, Graham, next week. November house and unit prices, get excited. Will we still see growth in the market at the end of the year? Uh, I'll give you a, a little tip. The answer to that is yes, um, Oct in mainly yes. October retail sales, so the Reserve Bank will be looking very closely at that as well. Uh, let's hope they don't you know, continue to try to talk it down, particularly the ABS as we've discussed before. And the latest weekend auction results. So what a big day we've had today, Graham, uh, in, uh, in the housing market. And uh, it, uh, it's big every weekend, isn't it, Brian? 
Well, so far, Doc, yeah, I think uh, I think it's been pretty pretty in line with what you and I've been talking about over the it's, last couple yep. of years. So I'm not sure where uh, we might have to apply for a job as staff <laughs> at the Reserve Bank. Cause, no, uh, no, 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 then- no. We'll get the blame then. If any- <laughs> we'll get the blame if anything goes wrong. No, 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 well, no. Yeah, but we're right better more than they're right. So, you know, anyway. Well, it's, anyway. But, uh, a pl- but they- Pleasure but Grant, they couldn't got- afford us. They couldn't afford us, mate. So no, uh, true, 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 it's, true. Uh, well, it's a pleasure as always, Doc. And I uh, really you, appreciate the uh, RBA bashing today. Well, and really, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, anyone looking for the app, you can reach out. It's in our private community yes, yes, page. Yes. You can get the password yeah. there. It's That's pinned to the app. top of the community page. It's a great little app. Tells you what's happening right here and now. Rentals, and we're going to add to that. So look out for the. Uh, the Big Brother version of uh, of that app, which will have uh, some extra special information for investors, particularly about yields. So um, always, always on the move here, Graham. At my housing market, of course, okay. Infinity is is exactly the same. So uh, same time, same bat channel next week. We'll see you all next week. Thanks as always, Doc, and we'll see who we can bash and pick on next week. Yeah, it's always a bit of fun. Thanks, Doc.